Now, the third one here is called an open listing. Some states call it a non-exclusive listing. Well, that non-exclusive should give you an insight into this listing and some of the peculiarity. <laughs> That's a big word for a 10-year-old. <laughs> some of the strange benefits that may come with an open listing. First of all, simply by the word non-exclusive, that should tell you that the seller can enter into as many of these as he wants. Remember, under the previous two, using the word exclusive, they could only enter into one with one broker. In an open or non-exclusive, they can enter into as many as they want, as long as the agent agrees, okay? So what you could see, think about this, what you could see in this front yard are five yard signs <laughs> Beside each other, you got the KW yard sign, you got the Modulin Group yard sign, you got a Remax, you got a Bob's Realty yard sign, and you know whatever yard sign, and his for sale by owner yard sign. Okay. Here's the kicker in this: the buyer, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. The agent that brings the buyer also gets credit as the listing agent, and they end up getting dual agency. Sometimes you will hear dual agency called me, me deal because me, me, they get paid both sides of the commission. If it's done on a small house, it's called a mini me. <laughs> All right. No, it's not. So listen, let's go back. If you've got five yard signs and some buyer drives by and for whatever reason, he remembers the phone number on one of those yard signs. Maybe it was an easy phone number to remember like 865-9400. Or maybe it had a picture that he really liked or the color scheme. I don't care. But whatever reason he remembers and calls that broker and says, hey, dude, I saw your sign in that yard. I want to go look at the house. And he ends up buying the house. That broker becomes the procuring cause for the listing side and the selling side because that's who the buyer called. The other four yard signs get zero. All right. They get zero. So while the seller may enter into as many as he wants, a lot of real estate agents will not enter into this agreement or won't take the listing, so to speak, because they know they could be in competition with one, two, five, 20 other brokers and end up doing a bunch of marketing work and not get the buyer, therefore they wouldn't get the listing either. So they end up with zero. So a lot of agents won't even enter into this. Matter of fact, we haven't got to the MLS yet, but as a matter of fact, brokers that are in the same MLS system typically can't do this because once one agent lists it on the MLS, the second broker would go to list it to do his portion, right? And he tries to put it in the MLS. The MLS system is going to say, sorry, that house is already listed. You can't enter it. So the only broker that got the information into the MLS system was the first one that did it first and beat everybody else. So not only is it not common to do, in most MLS areas, it's impossible to do because you can't list the same house multiple times in the MLS. They will not allow a duplicate listing of the same property. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you can't fudge around with your MLS system 
and make it seem like it's a different listing. Yes, there's all kinds of little tricks that we're not going to get into. But legally or technically, uh, you can't list the property. So you say, <clears throat> well, Raymond, why does this exist? It exists for a specific type of property or a property that is sufficiently unique enough that may warrant buyers from multiple regions to buy, all right? So follow my logic here. Typically, when you're living inside of, say, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, or Nashville, Indiana, most buyers tend to be already in that neighborhood. Um, I'm saying most, so don't go, well, you're wrong because of, I get it, but most typically do. But what about a property that is sitting on Lake Monroe down on Bloomington, Indiana, that is a weekend cabin? Where do you think that buyer is actually sitting? What? Indianapolis maybe, right? What about Bloomington? What about Louisville, Kentucky for someone who wants to buy a cabin to go fishing on the weekend? All three of those that I just mentioned are different MLS areas and therefore would allow different brokers to put that property in different regions so that the seller gets the maximum exposure because this property is sufficiently going to be wanted by a lot of people that could be sitting anywhere. Um, Hilbert, when he sold his house on the north side of Indianapolis, sold for $25 million. How many buyers are in Indianapolis that could afford a $25 million house? One, maybe a Colts player. But if you expanded that buyer group, to include areas like Cincinnati or Louisville or Chicago or a buyer out of Fort Wayne. How do you reach them? Because your MLS doesn't go there. What that seller would do is contract with a buyer and say, hey, Raymond, I want you to list the property in the Indianapolis MLS so those buyers can see it. And then they're going to call Kurt down in Louisville and go, hey, Kurt, I want you to list the property in the Kentucky and Jeffersonville, Indiana area so that those buyers could potentially see it. And then call Aaron down in Evansville and go, okay, I want you to list it in Evansville. That way the seller is getting the maximum exposure for his property. That would be a good use case scenario of where open listing exists, all right? So that is an open listing. There's our, those are the three that we have. And remember, the protection for the buyer goes up. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke that. I was watching my mistake on the screen. The protection for the agent is increased the higher we go on this list. The most protective because I get paid no matter what on this one right here. I get paid no matter what, but there is one exception, that's the seller. And I only get paid here if I'm the one that brings the buyer and I'm competing against a whole bunch of other listing agents. So think of that and remember that, hint, hint, maybe a test question, which one is the most protective, all right? Now there's a couple other listings I wanna talk about real quick that you could be using for the seller is this thing called a net listing. A net listing is potentially illegal unless there are a couple things that are done with this listing. So let me give you an example of what's going on <clears throat> or a scenario that may best explain this. There is an area inside of Indianapolis, Indiana called Broad Ripple. Broad Ripple is a yuppie, affluent area, I don't know how to describe it, that has a strong pull for people, and the prices on the houses 
are about one and a half times what they normally think they should be. So think about an area like that in whatever city you're sitting in, King Park in Fort Wayne, you know, uh, something down like, uh, what is it, Indian Creek and in, in, in uh, uh, Tampa Bay is an area like this. Um, so a little old lady buys a house 30 years ago in that little area. Now, 30 years later, she's going to sell the house. And some broker comes in that maybe is unscrupulous and says, oh, okay, so you paid 30000 for it. Don't worry, I'll get you your 30000 back. And whatever I sell it above 30, I'll keep as my commission. And then he goes out and sells it for 300 grand and takes advantage of the lady. That is the reason these are or potentially illegal. A net listing is when the seller says, I need to net this number. Anything over that number, you get to keep as your commission. And thinking about the scenario I just gave you, you could see how that an unscrupulous broker could take advantage of a client that is not well aware of the value of their home based on the current market. So most states discourage this or outright make it illegal unless there are a couple things that are done with it, okay? So first of all, if it's a net listing, it must be disclosed as a net listing to all people in the deal. All right, so you would put on the listing agreement, it's a net listing. That way the uh, title company can see it. That way when it gets recorded, the court systems could see it. And then the second thing that's usually required is the maximum amount of commission that you are going to earn in this deal. All right. So you would write, oh, you bought it for 30. How about we sell it for 37? I'll keep the seven and get your 30 back. That way, everybody knows that you are not trying to scam this person or make a whole bunch of money and not having the client's best interest at heart. So in a net listing, these are required, at least in Indiana, to make it at least not illegal. All right. Now, if you go in and go, yeah, uh, I'll sell it to you, but don't worry, my maximum commission is going to be three hundred thousand. Somebody's going to have a problem with that down that line. The lender, because it's on the listing agreement, the closing title company, the recorder's office, the attorney that will eventually get a hold of you. By the way, the real estate commission. So. That's why these two requirements are usually placed upon a net listing so that no one really does take advantage of the problem.